<laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Dr. Ku. Yes, Good afternoon, Dr. Muhammad Imran from uh, Lahore, Pakistan. Here. I am Dr. Ming from Vietnam. Yeah. Uh, thank you for joining us for Hanya and Endocrine session of KSELS 2020. My name is Do Hun Ku from India University in Korea, and I'm a chair of this session. Please welcome our participants. Before starting lecture, I would like to introduce our speakers today. In this session, six speakers will talk to us about hernia, thyroid, and breast topics. The first speaker is Jin Soo Park from Gyeonggi University in Korea. He will give a lecture on efficacy of non-fixation and permanent fixation in laparoscopy key P repair of inguinal hernia. The second speaker is Dr. Min Wen from Hu University Hospital in Vietnam will deliver a lecture on Laparoscopic processes of vaginal ligation using percutaneous internal ring suturing in children. And the third speaker, Jun Hyuk Lee from Gachon University in Korea, will present a, a lecture about deep running technology based automatic parasitic detection algorithm during cyridectomy. Uh, the first speaker is Muhammad Imran Kokhtar from Pakistan. He will give a lecture on our experience of endoscopic cyrodectomy at Lahir General Hospital. The fifth speaker is Jamin Yu from Samsung Medical Center in Korea. He will deliver a lecture on robot assisted deeper sparing mastectomy will immediate breast reconstruction. Initial experience of Korea of endoscopy minimal access breast surgery study group. And the last speaker, GRE from Yonsei University in Korea, will present the lecture about development of training program for robotic mastectomy using cadaver and Paulson models. So please enjoy the lecture. And after all lectures, we'll have a question and answer time with our speakers. And please feel free to ask our speakers your questions by clicking question button at the right of the section or via the chat window. Thank you. We will start the oral session. Today, I would like to talk about the efficacy of non-fixation and permanent tech fixation and laparoscopic TP repair of inguinal hernia. I have no personal or financial interest to declare, and I have no financial support from industry source at the current presentation. The most common types of hernia are inguinal that account for 75% of her hernias. The prevalence rate of inguinal hernia is 15 to 45% at different ages that require surgical repair. Various inguinal hernia surgery methods have been introduced by many surgeons the recurrence rate after inguinal hernia surgery has been reported to less than 5%. Laparoscopic hernia repair, especially, has been recognized as an excellent surgery and widely conducted on patients with recurrent inguinal hernia nowadays. Despite all of this advantage, some patients experience short-term post-operative growing discomfort, sometimes progressing to chronic pain, and seroma hematoma and urinary retention can develop after TP surgery. The most serious complication is a recurrence after surgery. The tech used for mass fixation is associated with a nerve injury that causes post-surgical growing pain. Therefore, several methods 
such as no fixation or five wrinkle loop fixation has been adopted to reduce post-operative groin pain. In this paper, non-fixation of mesh provide comparable surgical efficacy as compared with the fixation and served as a reliable alternative. The benefits of non-fixation method included lower incidence of post-operative urinary tension and less short-term post-operative pain and lower cost. So, the aim of this study was to compare the surgical efficacy and safety of fixation and non-fixation method in laparoscopic TP hernia repair. The study population was 191 patients who were diagnosed with inguinal hernia and who underwent TP hernia repair from June 2016 to January 2019 in Gyeonggi University Hospital. We exclude the patient with a previous history of pelvic surgery and recurrent hernia. In our setup, a polyatex mesh, which is made of polyester with good compliance and ease of use, was used. And according to patient height, uh, we use a different size of mesh. In mesh fixation group, we use a tacker at, at the retro pubic symphysis and cupus ligament and retro anterior abdominal wall using autosuture tacker. In this study, we compared patient characteristics, post-operative parameters, including operation time and location and type of hernia, and post-operative pain, length of stay, time to return to daily activity, and post-operative complications such as seroma, hematoma, acute urinary retention, and recurrence between two groups. There is no significant difference in sex, age, side of hernia, and types of hernia between two groups. The most common side of hernia was unilateral, and types of hernia was uh, indirect type. Also, there is no significant difference between two groups in operation time, Energies uses after surgery and length of stay. There was no significant difference in post op complications such as seroma, growing swelling, wound infection, urinary retention, and chronic pain after TP surgery, and recurrence rate. Totally, no fixation group shows. 14% in tacker fixation shows 18% of post op complication. This study has a limitation. The study is a small sample size from single center. The study is a retrospective study. Several factors such as high BMI, surgeon skill, and long follow up can be influential in evaluating the result of hernia repair. However, the study cannot control these factors well. In summary, non-fixation of mesh provided comparable surgical efficacy as compared with fixation and served as a reliable alternative. Post-operative complication and pain following the application of mesh fixation and non-fixation method is not different. Chronic pain and recurrence rate following the application of mesh fixation and non-fixation method is not different. Thank you for your attention.
Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Nguyen Nguyen from Vietnam, Hue University Hospital. I really appreciate the KSELS 2020 and the Carrot Congress organization gave me a chance to present our study with entitled Laparoscopic Patient Processes Varingalis Ligation Yield Percutaneous Internal Ring Suturing in Children, the earliest experience in Vietnam. As you see me the slide, the photo of my, my university, and I have no conflict of interest to disclose. Firstly, I would like to talk about some background information. Laparoscopic inguinal hernia was first performed by Dr. L. Hari in 1997, and over four decades, laparoscopic pediatric inguinal hernia repair can be classify into two main approach, intracorporeal or extracorporeal ligation. The percutaneous internal ring suturing peers uh, were first introduced by Dr. Park Kowalski in 2004. Uh, and as you see in the picture, under laparoscopic guide vision, a 19 gauze in resin needle were with a, a no, unknown absorptable trees inside the power of the needle were placed through the abdominal wall into the peritoneal cavity. By moving the in resin needle, the trees part under per peritoneum rather unchained into the adnial sac. The canal was tightened from outside and play in the subcutaneous play space. The advantage of the, this kind of technique is contralateral acne detection, uh, decreased pain, fatter recovery, and the better wound commences. Uh, how about the but lack of evidence about recurrent ray and operative type between the open annual repair and laparoscopic annual repair? In this table, you can see many studies of different minimal invasive methods to repair pediatric areas. The complication and the recurrent seem to be linked in the percutaneous technique than in the traditional techniques. The purpose of our study aims to evaluate the introduction of the peer technique at our hospital. Uh, in our study, we indicate pediatric for the patient with inguinal apnea and communicating hydrocell. Totally 40 children uh, from the 9th month to 6 year old were performed the piece from the September 2019. Here is the, here is the patient with the communicating hydrocell. When we press in scrotum, we can see the fluids go through internal ring. Internet in May, we performed the pierce technique to close the internal ring. Uh, and you can see the uh, three prolan need uh, prolans around the internal ring and after closure from the outside. And you and we can see on this in May, the incidence very small. As a in our 40 person, we performed the pierce in the 45 internal ring. The operation time was around 25 minutes for unilateral and the 34 minutes for bilateral. All procedures were done by one children. Uh, we have a 2K uh, with the injury to body coast van. And uh, we also have 1K recurrent in the patient with pre uh, preoperative diagnosed with the communicating hydrocell. Uh, at the second operation, we found out the recurrent due to income list clothing the internal ring. And from the our study, we conclude that the percutaneous internal ring suturing procedure is safe and effective to introduce, and the chromatic treatments were excellent. Thank you for your attention. My name is Chun Hyop Lee. I'm an assistant professor in Hachan University at the Department of Surgery. Um, I specialize in thyroid and parathyroid surgery. 
The title of my presentation today is The Development of Deep Learning Technology Based uh, Automatic Real-Time Parathyroid Detection Algorithm During Thyroidectomy. So, uh, the definition of artificial intelligence is the study of algorithm that gives machines ability to reason and to perform cognitive functions such as problem solving, object and word recognition, and decision making. Artificial intelligence is uh, vastly utilized in the field of medicine, and it can be mainly divided into uh, two branches. First is the physical branch, which uses mainly robotics to aid the medical care, uh, such as care bots, which help uh, elderly, elderly patients in their daily routine, or surgical robots, which is um, which almost everyone here knows about the uh, Da Vinci robotic system. And there are also uh, developments in the nanorobots. They are used as, they are uh, the possibility of them as a new, unique new drug delivery system is being uh, investigated. But the more uh, commonly known part is the virtual branch, which is represented by machine learning or what we call deep learning. Uh, with machine learning, we can control the health management systems using the electronic health records, or it can be used to actively guide physicians in their treatment decisions and also their uh, treatments. So, machine learning can be uh, machine learning algorithms can be uh, classified into three uh, types. First is the supervised learning. This is the classification and prediction algorithms based on previous examples. The user or the developers label the sample, sample data and then set strict boundaries upon which the algorithm map operates. Uh, this is very useful in identifying subtle patterns in large data sets in which uh, human eyes cannot easily detect. For example, uh, the surgeon or the developer uh, labels these pictures as gallbladder, and then the algorithm uses these as training sets to recognize them. And then the next step, the developer gives pictures uh, which includes uh, gallbladders and other that isn't gallbladder. And then the algorithm processes this information and then classifies and classifies it. The next branch is unsupervised learning. This is the ability of the algorithm to describe patterns without direct control of the de developers. For example, uh, in this picture, the surgeons give random pictures without uh, labeling them, and then the machine learns it, and then uh, can classify whether there is a bleeding or not without any uh, previous input. This is very useful in uh, discovering patterns which is not known to humans, or such as protein-protein interaction algorithms, to find new target uh, therapeutic target therapies. The next step is uh, the next type is reinforcement learning. Uh, this is uh, this is when the machine uses its previous experience to learn and then to reinforce its algorithm. So it uses reward and punishment sequences and then learns from its success and mistakes. It's a self-sustained system, improving itself based on uh, trial and error. So, so what does uh, artificial intelligence have to do with endocrine surgery? In thyroid surgery, uh, it's very important to save the parathyroid glands because they are in the center of the calcium homeostasis. But post-surgical hypothyroidism is very common, almost 30, 20 to 30 percent in all thyroidectomy cases. And the most common case of hypocalcemia, which is caused by hypoparathyroidism, is due to surgery. Uh, clinical presentations uh, involve neuromuscular irritability, but severe hypocalcemia can lead to cardiac symptoms. Uh, our group uh, <clears throat> presented data in JAMA uh, by using the national database to prove that with the decrease of thyroidectomy cases, the post-surgical hypothyroidism case decreased a lot. So 
which is which tells us that as surgeons we must be very careful in saving parathyroids when uh, operating for thyroid cancers. So the aim was to the aim of our study was to harness machine learning technology in developing a real-time parathyroid detecting algorithm for thyroid surgeons so that we can save parathyroid more effectively during thyroid cancer surgery. So we used open thyroidectomy cases. We confirmed parathyroid, parath confirmed the parathyroids, uh, took a clip of them using laparoscopic camera and also commercial cameras. We uh, performed fine needle aspiration um, and then to measure the PTH level, and we collected the image of the confirmed parathyroids. And then we collected the data, and we processed it, and looked for the results. So the setting is very um, technical, and I am, I'm not uh, a specialist in AI, but we processed the image, we distorted it in many ways, and then we used the retina net backbone as the algorithm, ba the basic algorithm to learn for the machine to learn which is the parathyroid. So, and then after learning, we have to, uh, the machine has to detect uh, which is the true thyroid. And we use the U IOU, which is the intersection over union value over 0.3% with a, probably, a probability over half. And we use the tenfold cross validation so in this, pic, in this clip, the green box is the labeled data. I confirm that this is the parathyroid. The blue box is the machine indicating which is the parathyroid. In most cases, it's correctly indicating parathyroid, but this is very similar to, this fat tissue is very similar to parathyroid, and sometimes there are false positive results. This is also another example. So the screen box is the, is the label that I did, and then the blue box is the indicator marked by the machine learning algorithm. So you can see it's fairly okay, but sometimes it indicates other tissues, such as the muscles of, over here. This one, I indicated this part only as the parathyroid, but it also indicates the peri periparathyroid tissues also. The next one is um, sort of a false positive. This one is the parathyroid gland, but it keeps on um, detecting other places, such as the fat tissue or the muscles. So clearly, our data is not perfect yet. And then when we did the validation study, the, in the initial results were very poor. The sensitivity was almost 40 to 50%, which is very useless in the clinical setting. So we sort of um, uh, changed the algorithm. This is the, and relied not only on AI, but we used other image tracking systems, and we filed a patent for this algorithm. And then the sensitivity was improved to 63 to 76%. Uh, now we are trying to apply this to robotic surgery, especially in thyroid, in robotic barbathyroidectomy, because it offers standardized views. It's easy to use the files, image files, and we hopefully can collaborate with uh, surgical intuitive in the future. So. I'd like to give special thanks to the uh, Hachin University Medical Instrument R&D Center, Professor Kim Gwangi and Professor Kim Young-jae for uh, collaborating with me in this project. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I will start with the name of Allah, the most gracious and most merciful. I feel uh, much humbled and I want to thank uh, the Korean Society of Endoscopy and Laparoscopic Surgery 
for giving me an opportunity to present in front of such an august audience. I'm Dr. Mohammad Imran Kokhar, and I will talk about endoscopic thyroidectomy, a new era of cosmesis at Lahore General Hospital, Lahore, Pakistan. This is our team, and here I'm with my uh, mentor, my professor, Professor Mohammad Farooq Absal. He is head of department, and he's advanced laparoscopic and bariatric surgeon. We'll go through history briefly, then uh, we'll see what are the different approaches. Then I will talk about axilla, best so shoulder approach, our experience at Lahore General Hospital, then I will conclude. Dr. Michael Ghania, he was the first person who performed first endoscopic uh, cervical surgery for parathyroid gland in 1996. And here I'm with him at SAGE's meeting 2018 in Seattle. Hoshner in 1997 successfully performed endoscopic thyroidectomy for B9 tumor. Dr. Tran Ngoc Long, he started axilla breast shoulder approach in 2003, and he's my trainer as well. I got training in 2012 in Hanoi National Hospital. What are different approaches? These are can be divided into cervical and extra cervical approaches, and extra cervical are actually the hybrid approaches. These are axilla both breast, both breast approach both axilla and breast approach, axilla breast shoulder approach. And there is a new technique, transoral endoscopic thyroidectomy vestibular approach, a nose procedure where a 10 mm port and two 5 mm ports are inserted to the vestibule and flap is lifted into it. You can see the cervical approach, uh, we have to insert multiple cannula in the neck that can, that lead scar postoperatively. Uh, in axilla, both press approach, one axilla is used and both press are being uh, used. In both axilla and both press approach, you can see four ports are being inserted. In axilla breast shoulder port, which we are uh, using, 10 mm port is inserted to the axilla just in front of the mid axillary line, 5 mm port to circumvalular area and 5 mm port at the neck. The cameraman uh, uh, in the, at the uh, tip of his shoulder. The cameraman has a, a difficult position to uh, control uh, the camera. Surgeon is standing ipsilaterally, assistant and nurse on the opposite side. What are the steps? Uh, after inserting the ports, carbon dioxide is insufflated and a pressure of 8 to 10 millimeter is maintained. First landmark is identification of suprasternal notch. Then Sternocleidomastoid muscle is identified and dissection is continued in the neck and thyroid cartilage is the third landmark. Dissection is continued between sternocleidomastoid and stab muscles. Then splitting of stab muscles is done using monopolar diathermy. Recurrent laryngeal nerve and parathyroid glands are identified and preserved. Hemithyroidectomy is done using harmonic scalpel. Specimen retrieval for axillary axillar port and same steps are repeated if we have to go for total thyroidectomy. So he, here are some pictures. Uh, you can see 10 mm port in the axilla, 5 mm port at two o'clock position uh, of the circumferential area. And the third port is be, being inserted at tip of uh, the right shoulder. This is first landmark supersternal notch. Uh, uh, where this, you can see this uh, glistening white uh, supersternal notch area, blue the real tissue sternocleidomastoid of uh, ipsilateral side and the nodule covered with step muscles on the right side. This is external view showing the flap lifted in the neck up to the thyroid cartilage. Nodule is being exposed by splitting uh, step muscles using monopolar diathermy and the nodule is exposed properly. Superior pole is being dissected using the harmonic scalper and preserving the superior thyroid uh, parathyroid gland, inferior pole dissection with preservation of inferior parathyroid gland, recurrent laryngeal nerve is preserved uh, during dissection and hemithyroidectomy is completed and this is showing uh, right recurrent laryngeal nerve preserved. Specimen is uh, retrieved in a bag prepared from gloves and is retrieved through the axillary port, 10 mm port, you can see. This is nodule with right hemithyroidectomy, and the drain is inserted through the axillary port 
Actually, this is uh, uh, another patient having left-sided dimethyldecme showing just to show the position of suction ray. So we performed 20 cases till now in Lahore General Hospital. Uh, 14 were right-sided and six were left-sided. We had to convert in two patients because of bleeding. Uh, one of our patients developed seroma, another patient skin burn, another patient wound infection. All were managed conservatively and discharged in good condition. 100 minutes is our mean operative time. Initially, it was uh, almost um, uh, 200 or sometimes more than 200 minutes, but gradually we uh, have managed and now we are performing almost in 85 to 90 minutes, alhamdulillah. Post-operative hospital stay is one to two days, and our data is comparable to international data as well, regarding the time, operative time, post-operative hospital stay and the complications. These are few pictures showing pre-operative and post-operative neck. Another patient uh, post-operatively, yet another, and this one also. And here you can see the difference between endoscopic and open technique. Pictures are worth 100,000 words. So I will conclude that endoscopic thyroidectomy by means of axilla breast shoulder approach is safe procedure with good cosmetic outcome Endoscopic thyroidectomy is a new approach introduced in recent years with more experience, operative time, and complications related to surgery shall improve further. The questions will be asked during question-answer uh, session at the end of this session. And thank you very much, k -Cells and all the audience. Nice to meet you. This is Dr. Jamil Yu from Samsung Medical Center. Today, my topic is about the robot assist nipple sparing mastectomy on this initial experience of Korea BSG. I'm going to present following contents. First, I will explain the background of robot assist nipple sparing mastectomy, and I will explain the reason of initiation of Korea BSG, and I will show the data of experiences of robot assisted nipple sparing mastectomy. Zuna robot surgery is now widely used in various kinds of surgeries, including oncologic surgery. It is known to many kinds of advantages. As breast surgery has been developed, nowadays nipple sparing mastectomy is very popular. In nipple sparing mastectomy, there are many kinds of skin incision. However, almost of them are visible or long scar. To avoid visible scar, endoscopic pore surgery developed more than 20 years ago. However, compared to long history, endoscopic pore surgery is not popular. Even though endoscopic pore surgery have many advantages, it has some disadvantages, so it is not popular. As technology has been developed, in 2014, fourth generation of Da Vinci XI system developed. In 2014, Dr. Tweskas initiated robot NSM project. He is the first breast surgeon performing robot liposurgery mastectomy. He reported his first experience in 2017. He took around three hours showing a rapid running curve. There was no major complications. In Korea, Hyungsa Park first reported his experience of robot assisted liposurgery mastectomy. Using the robot system, we can operate just a 4 or 6 centimeter using invisible scar, so we can increase patient satisfaction. However, FDA warns robot assisted surgery in breast cancer patient. They mentioned that only specialized, trained, and practiced in their use surgeon could robot assist the surgery. The warning follows the publication of a study in the NEJM. That said, robot-assisted cervical cancer surgeries had reduced 
survivor than open abdominal hysterectomy. This is the data. They show that there was a significant worse disease-free survivor in robot-assisted surgery compared to open surgery. To avoid that kind of miserable results, we initiate Korea BSG. We are preparing education program and also we are preparing prospective multicenter code in Korea. And already about 10 institutions performing robot assisted nipple-sparing mastectomy. I will show the data of Korea BSG. We collected from eight institutions between November 2016 and January 2020. 73 women underwent 82 robot assisted nipple sparing mastectomy by 11 breast surgeons and 9 plastic surgeons enrolled in this study. This data is first report of Korea BSG and second largest numbers in the world. The median age was 45 years old and the median BMI was 21. Seven patients had BRCA carriers and most of the patients were only breast cancer patient, and seven patients underwent risk-reducing mastectomy, and 22 patients underwent bilateral mastectomy, and 76% were ER positive, and only one patient decreased due to frozen margin positive. About the positioning, 80% of patients underwent raised arm position, and about 74% underwent using Da Vinci XI system, and about 10% of patients underwent extra lymph node dissection, followed by sentinel lymph node biopsy, and about 98% of patients underwent reconstruction using implant based, and two patients underwent autolose tissue. The median total operation time was 320 minutes using the autologous tissue showed longer operation than using implant based and the median mastectomy time was 190 minutes. All patients used mid axillary line, the median skin incision length was 46 mm. Only two cases need reoperation. Among nine cases of nipple ischemia, one case required nipple excision, and among five cases of skin ischemia, two cases need skin incision, and there was no conversion to open surgery or cases of mortality. This showed rapid running curve. First operator, after 13 cases, reached running curve. However, second operator, reached after nine cases. In summary, robot-assisted nipple sparing mastectomy with immediate breast reconstruction is acceptable and feasible to deploy patients with early breast cancer and the needs for risk-reducing surgery. Of course, further prospective registry or Randomized controlled trial for robot assisted nipple sparing mastectomy are warranted for evaluation of the surgical outcomes, patient satisfaction, and oncological outcomes. Thank you very much. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Chia Lee, a clinical fellow in Severance Hospital, Seoul, Korea. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk about this subject. Today, I'd like to make a presentation about the development of training program for robotic mastectomy using cadaver and porcine models. There is no conflict of interest for this study. During my presentation, taking any pictures or video is prohibited. Practice makes perfect, and everyone knows this quote. Especially for surgeons, practice makes perfect. Surgeons must do their best to be perfect. Otherwise, surgeons can lead patients to death. 
For the effective practice, beginners have learned surgical skills through the operation themselves with appropriate supervision by experienced senior surgeons traditionally. However, there are a lot of limitations of resources, including facilities, supervisors, and education times. For these reasons, cadavers and animals have been used for skill labs for various types of surgeries. In the previous study, a skill lab using cadaver or animals has been suggested as one of the essential steps to develop a standardized surgical education program. Robotic nipple sparing mastectomy with immediate breast reconstruction has been developed by several surgeons recently. However, only a few surgeons can perform RNSM so far. For the wider application of RNSM, more effective education program can help more surgeons to participate RNSM with sufficient skills and safety. So, we aim to report establishment and evaluation of effectiveness of cadaveric or animal skill labs for RNSM. Let's move on to the materials and methods. We performed 20 RNSMs from 9 cadavers and 1 porcine from December 2013 to June 2020. A total of 13 surgeons, 11 breast surgeons, and 2 plastic surgeons participated in these skill labs. DaVinci SI, XI, and SP were used for skill labs. Cadaveric or porcine skill labs were categorized into two phases, consist of two modules according to the purpose of a skill lab, the initial setup phase and the training phase. The initial setup phase was performed by surgeons who had no experience of RNSM and no supervisors because it was the first attempt to perform RNSM. The training phase was designed for beginners by an experienced surgeon who has developed and was actively performing RNSM. We used six breasts in three cadavers for the setup of the multiport and the single port RNSM respectively. Four procedures were performed by DaVinci SI system and two procedures were by DaVinci XI system. Gasless techniques were applied for all RNSM procedures of the multiple system modules in the initial set of phase. There was one event of injury of the medial part of pectoralis muscle and coaster cartilage in the first skill lab. No intraoperative event an open conversion occurred except this event. Eight procedures in three cadavers and a porcine model were consecutively applied for the training phase. All procedures were performed by gas inflated technique using DaVinci XI system. Most surgeons who participated in the skill labs phase were younger than 40 years old. Three of nine trainees have experienced breast surgery over 50 cases at the moment of the skill lab. All trainees completed dry lab using a robot simulator before the skill lab. Two-thirds of the trainees were exposed to robotic breast surgery as an observer before the skill lab. Half of the trainees assisted RNSM before the training. Two trainees have experienced RNSM as an operator before the skill lab. Most of trainees responded favorable scores. However, delivery of the knowledge of required for robotic surgery was not relatively met to trainees' expectation when compared to other questionnaires. Additionally, mixed explanation and opportunity to practice was not satisfactory enough for three trainees. NASA Task Load Index, the gold standard for measuring subjective workload, across a wide range of applications was applied to some participating trainees and the results will be further analyzed later. 
We developed cadaveric and animal skin labs for robotic breast surgery. Successful application of innovative surgical system for sophisticated surgical procedure needs appropriate educational programs. We can suggest that these educational programs can be a cornerstone of training RNSM for breast surgeons without experience and knowledge of robotic surgical systems. We summarize general features of the two models. Cost of porcine models are less expensive, more accessible than cadaveric models in our institution. Because porcine models is a vivo model, vascular structure is intact, and simulation of bleeder ligation, bleeding control is more feasible than cadaveric models. However, similarity of anatomical structure is way better in cadaveric models than porcine models. There are several limitations of the study. The small number of the trainees who participated in the training phase, retrospective design, lack of learning curve analysis, and objective measurement of the training scores besides questionnaires. We suggest that cadaveric or porcine skill labs for RNSM can be one of the essential programs offering safe and efficient training. Standardized training protocol of RNSM should be established. Thank you for listening to my presentation. The speakers. You hear me? The speakers. Our speakers, thank you for your lectures. You uh, from now, we'll have a uh, question and answer time with our speakers. speakers uh, we have three speakers with us, uh, and I'd we'll like to introduce uh, them. Time uh, first, Professor Nat Minh Nguyen from Q University Hospital in Vietnam and Professor Mohamed Imran Kokar from Pakistan and lastly, Professor Lee from Yonsei University in Korea. Mm. Unfortunately, Professor Min Su Park in Junsha Ri and Yu Jamin Yu from Korea could not join this live Q&A due to their schedules. Uh, if you have any questions about their lectures, please submit your questions via the chat window and we'll forward them. Uh, is there any questions? Uh, because there's no question from the ch uh, chat window, uh, I'll give you a um, the, what, question. Uh, Professor Yen? Yeah? Uh, do you hear me, Professor Yen? Not me, Yen? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, from the actual uh, PIRS, Practitioners Interlink Suturing, was effective and minimally invasive and even cosmetic compared to conventional or TP repair. Uh, it not EP nice. EP also showed a case of a, as an indirect hernia. Yeah. But there's a, just a, a, a hydro shoe case video. Yeah. Yes. Um, it's usually the, the patient in the pediatric patient, the, the apnea like in, indirect apnea. So I think the, the PS technique that uh, this is enough for the fitness problem in the any other problem in the, the pediatric patient. For the indirect hernia, the process was the same? Uh, you mean the in indirect is the same? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, Professor Mohamed Inna Kokar? Yes, I'm here. Yeah. Uh, the from the actual, just uh, there are two cases of conversion. Yeah. Uh, what was uh, the reason? To... Could you explain to us? Yeah. Uh, the both of uh, these uh, patients, they had bleeding uh, from uh, uh, muscular branches, and uh, there was uh, in one case there was problem with our system. We couldn't uh, manage uh, that bleeding. That's why we had to convert. But Alhamdulillah, there was uh, nothing uh, serious, and we controlled when we converted, uh, and uh, we managed uh, this bleeding and uh, completed the surgery. Okay, I see. Yes, boy. Oh, yes. And uh, it, it, this was this was actually during our uh, early cases. Yeah, 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 yeah. I see. Um, yeah. And last is uh, as I have a, one comment for to Professor Jerry. Uh, as you know, lobotic cytorectomy has developed through the same process uh, using the cadaver and porcelain models. So, the, the photo of lobotic mastectomy that is a very meaningful attempt. Uh, I think it will be helpful to beginners if a simulation video for entire mastectomy process is developed. Uh, as for uh, our institution, we have a, a simulation uh, skill unit. And for the robotic mastectomy, I would like to recommend the uh, simulation program. Is there any plan for the simulation program? Well, thank you for your comments. Yeah. Uh, we are uh, planning to develop the uh, standard of procedure for the robotic mastectomy. Well, thank you for and your yeah, we are going uh, we uh, to develop for the beginners. The, uh, uh, and the yeah, I, I hope uh, uh, yeah, it'll gonna, uh, finish uh, to the, the establish the SOP as soon as possible. And probably uh, oh, we hope to include the, uh, some kinds of video or simulation with the, the, the SOP also. Yeah, thank you for your comments. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, mm, is, if there are no, any other questions, we, this session will be closed. I hope you have answered all your questions. Uh, this is all. We have time for the Q&A. Uh, thank you for your attention and participation. Thank you very much. Uh, this is all. We have time for the Q&A. Uh, thank you for your attention and participation.